greetings and praise the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Minister Coleman, and I want to welcome you back to another Christian's Endeavors Sunday School International. Today, our lesson, which is dated for January the 9th, 2022, is a very informative lesson. We today, just like last week, we're going to be touching on some domestic dynamics and relationships. Amen? So our lesson and its background is going to come from out of the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, the 21st chapter, the 8th through the 20th verse. And the title of our lesson is Injustice and Hope. Injustice and Hope. I'm going to read our key verse. And it is verse 17 through 18 of that 21st chapter of Genesis. And it says, And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. That is the promises of God. And the promises of God are yea and amen. We thank God for that. Let's pray as we get on into our lesson for today. Father God, we thank you. We come before your throne, God, with thanksgiving. We come before you with praise. We thank you, God, for being a keeper of your promises. Father God, as we go into this lesson today, we ask that you will anoint the servant, Lord, as I Deliver to your people what you have delivered to me. And we ask, Lord, that you would be uh, gracious and that you will anoint the ears and the hearts of those who will tune in to this message today and that they will receive from you the lesson and the application that you would have us to learn. Father God, we ask that Sunday schools all over the world, Lord God, that are conducted in your name, that you will especially anoint them, Father God, as they gather, Lord God, just to hear and to study your word. We thank you for leaders, preachers, pastors, ministers, evangelists, missionaries, God, that just continue to take your word abroad. And we thank you for every hearer, Lord God, that we too have an opportunity to spread your word. Father God, allow us to be obedient. As we use this platform, this YouTube platform, Lord God, to send the world your word. And this is our prayer. Bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, our lesson, it's topic, Injustice and Hope. Um, both deep words. Um, and as you all recall, if you've been following the lessons, we've been in the quarterly vein of justice law and history and our lessons as we've been taking them under this unit too thus far has been talking about God is the substance of justice or he is the source of justice amen so let's look at these two words in our lesson title in justice and hope and I believe this is the first time that we've actually taken a look with this word injustice. There's a lot of injustice that's going on in our land um, from the uh, civil standpoint all the way to the domestic standpoint and even down to an individual personal standpoint. Um, how do we see injustice? Because um, Injustice oftentimes is defined by way of that individual in whom such action has been taken against. It is the individual that will define whether they feel something is unjust or just. 
Amen. Um, it's not always something that is outwardly done. It is your perception of an act that has been done against you. Amen. Um, so injustice. Well, we have already defined multiple times what we felt justice was. Justice is uh, righteousness, um, uh, equity. It is doing things in a fair manner. It is the scales. You often see the picture of the law scales. And it is balancing law to make things just right, equal, fair, um, and when you see injustice then, injustice then would be the opposite. It is when you feel that something is not being done fair, not being done equitable, not being done right um, and pure, right? Um, and we know that God, once again, is the only one that can make things right. God is not an unjust God. God is a just God. Amen. And also, I'm going to tip the scale a little bit um, to say that even sometimes when we deserve just, that God goes above and beyond and puts a spin on what is just, and he would just simply favor us. Right? In someone's eyes, they might just want to just do what is fair. But maybe what is fair is not going to quite be befitting amen to the person that we want to just just do everything fair sometimes we can appreciate when god goes above and beyond and just gets really personal with us and our situations and he favors us amen rather than just being fair and comparing two people and just trying to balance out everything amen we thank God for his favor, amen? That goes above and beyond, I believe, being just, amen? Um, because we may not be deserving um, of what we truly desire in our heart or uh, what we truly deserve, right? We may not be deserving of it, but God will look beyond what we deserve and he will give us favor, on top of just amen um god knows he's the only one that can tip that scale and still be right my god so then we look at this word hope now hope let's look at hebrews 11 and 1 because we see this word hope um there uh faith is the substance of things hoped for faith is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of those things not seen okay so we have hope before we even come to the matter of faith there is something that we are hoping for there is an expectation there is a desire that is in us there is a dream um, there is a goal that we ponder within the depths of our spirit, our soul, and the, in the seat of our mind. We're hoping for a thing. And so this is what it is. So hope is the depth, is the very deep stratumments. It lies at the stratumments of substratumments of faith. Amen. We need hope first. And then we need that faith. That faith is what connects us to the fulfillment of our hope amen so we see that something here is deeply desired there's a deep desire there's a deep uh 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 prayer uh a dream uh a promise um that we're going to see in our lesson today now, some of the characters that's going to be in our lesson today, other than God, yeah, God and his promises, his written promise, um, but we have Abraham, Abraham, the father of faith, amen, Abraham, known as the father of many nations, um, Abraham, who was initially called Abram. And then we're going to get to his wife. 
his wife, initially her name Sarai, uh, but then God changed her name to Sarah. Um, and Sarah, he also gave the meaning of her name. She would be the mother of many nations. And the children, the offspring that they both were able to have, together they had Isaac, amen. Isaac was their firstborn child born to both Abraham and Sarah, but preceding Isaac would be Ishmael, and Ishmael would come about through the slave or the servant of Sarah. Her name is Hagar. Sarah would tell Hagar and Abraham to produce the child that God had long ago promised that Abraham would have, but he was unable to have as of yet with his wife Sarah. So her brilliant, her fleshly, <laughs> her impatient uh, plan was to, okay, well, maybe God, yes, he does want us to have this child, but since I'm unable to have the child up to this point, and I'm getting older and older, and will probably not be able to bear a child, I still want Abraham to have this child and have an heir for uh, the many, um, the many riches or let's say the legacy and uh, what have you that Abraham had. Sarah, just being his wife, loving him, wanted him to be able to have an heir. And so her plan was just go into Hagar, the slave woman, and allow her to be the surrogate. Um, she can be the surrogate uh, for our first child so that you may be able to have an heir. Okay, so that is kind of like the backdrop of where we are. Well, Abraham, without question, without pause, <laughs> he ran right in with Hagar uh, per the permission of his wife and uh, had the child. Amen. And their child was Ishmael. Now, Ishmael came along the way when Abraham was about 86 years old. Um, so yes, Abraham was up in age, but he had this child, um, and Ishmael, he grew, um, and then later on, God fulfilled his promise, as he always does, um, with time, you know, God doesn't always fulfill promise when he gives us a promise, when he gives us a dream, he doesn't always fulfill it right then and there. Um, but time and patience would eventually bring about the promised child that God had promised to Abraham and Sarah, this child being called Isaac. Amen. And God said that through Isaac, through this child, through the offspring of Isaac, will ultimately become the savior of many nations. Amen. Which would be Jesus Christ. So God fulfills his promise and God ultimately at age 100 for Abraham and age 90 for Sarah, that they would bring forth their own child, Isaac. So as we get into our lesson today, it's going to pick up um, at verse 8 um, and we're going to see what's going to become of now these two children being in the picture Ishmael and Isaac. All right? So let's go on ahead and, and go into our lesson. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Okay? And so the child Isaac grew and he was weaned. So according to the custom um, the child was on milk. He probably was on breast milk also. Um, and about the time he would be weaned would probably be somewhere between three and four years old. Okay. So no longer would you be on bottles and milk, amen, and on the breast. But now you're able to sit at the table with the, the older ones or even the older kids and you're able to eat food, meat, um, 
the vegetables and, and what have you. Amen. Solid food. And so that warrants a celebration. Amen. Amen. So when we look at that, we can take away probably two words from this verse eight. That at a certain point in time, we are supposed to grow up. Amen. Let us read verse nine. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar at this celebration. She saw the son of Hagar, Ishmael, the Egyptian woman, which she had born to Abraham, mocking. Okay. This child, Ishmael, was mocking Isaac. Now, Isaac, once again, he's only somewhere between three, probably four years old. Now, Ishmael, at this point, Ishmael born to Abraham at 86. This will kind of like make Ishmael about 17 years old. Amen. Because this is about at least 14 years later that he has had Isaac. And then Isaac is about three to four years old. So that's making Ishmael roughly about 17 years old, give or take. <clears throat> and he's mocking him. What is mocking him? Um, in some translations, or when you compare the context to other portions of scripture that use this word mocking, it can be, uh, labeled as being abusive, or it can also be persecuting. Um, so he was either persecuting Isaac or he was abusing him in some kind of way. Um, point being is that he was posing a threat. Amen. He was posing a threat to Isaac. And that's a no-no because remember, Isaac is the promised child. Isaac is uh, from God. Amen. Isaac is representing the promise. Isaac is representing uh, fulfillment, salvation. He's representing pure. He's representing spirit. He is representing hope. He is representing peace. He is representing being chosen. Amen. So Isaac have all of these attributes that is around him. Whereas in contrast, Ishmael is representing flesh. Ishmael is representing selfish uh, motive, um, impatience, hostility. Uh, Ishmael is representing unpure. Um, Ishmael is representing not being chosen, not being promised. Uh, Ishmael is representing the law. Okay. When we get really down to it, the law, whereas Isaac is representing promise. Isaac is representing spirit. Isaac is representing Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see in this lesson when we talk about this Isaac and the bond woman or the slave or the servant of, of Sarah, Hagar. When we see this word cast out, I want you to just see in your mind that basically this word cast out is to separate. The whole point is to separate, to do away with to come out from, amen, uh, because you cannot stand together, right? You cannot stand together. One is going to have to be lifted above the other. So when you think about the scales in this, you can't be just. You can't let both brothers dwell together. You just can't. And so this is one of the falses of this word injustice, Somebody's going to have to tip the scale. And we know who that somebody is going to be in our lesson. It's got to be Isaac. Because Isaac is going to have to be lifted above because he is promised. He is chosen. He is the covenant child. Amen. So just dropping again a thought to that word injustice. We want to know how can injustice show up in our lesson? That's one of the ways. And I told you favor is going to have to tip the scales of being just. Amen. So let's go ahead and look at this 10th verse. 
Wherefore she said unto Abraham, after she saw Ishmael mocking or posing a threat to Isaac. Now, it probably wasn't the first time this has happened. You know, Sarah was probably like, there was contention. Um, there was strife uh, between uh, the domestic relationship of Sarah and Hagar. And this all kicked off. Once Sarah, with her bright idea, having Abraham to go in and have relations or to sleep with Hagar in order to produce this first child, Sarah thought that this was a bright idea until Hagar actually got pregnant. And so with Hagar walking around, now being the bearer of Abraham's first child, supposedly the heir, amen, that was the custom, the first child, male child would be the heir. Amen. So she really felt that she had a gift and advantage over Sarah. Amen. And which she did. Amen. So she, with her stomach all poked out, I may be giving this baby back over to you, but let's not forget I was the one who carried the baby. I'm the baby mama. I'm the one that's going to be feeding the baby. So she felt like this was a bond that certainly her and, and Abraham shared. And even though Sarah would, you know, be taking the child on as her own, you know, the truth is at the heart of it, Sarah's not the mother of the firstborn child. Hagar is. So with this going around in Sarah's mind, this caused hostility between Sarah and Hagar. Amen. So probably Hagar was mocking Sarah. And Sarah, the Bible says, became more harsh with Hagar throughout her pregnancy. And even after Hagar had Ishmael. So Sarah was just like uneasy with this mother and her child being around her husband and with her being without a child yet. So when Sarah finally um, would have uh, or would get pregnant by Abraham, this gave Sarah a little bit more confidence and gave her a little bit more of an advantage, a little more leverage. Amen. Thank God for leverage. Amen. Thank God for the blessing. Amen. That God in that sense has balanced the scale. So now look, I got a baby now too. And my baby is by my own husband. This is what Sarah is probably saying in her mind, but I still got my eye on you and your son. I'm still watching you. Amen. Um, <laughs> So this is a lot of uh, dynamics that is going on uh, that we can probably just, you know, we can imagine, put our imagination to it, uh, how they were probably at odds. And so with Sarah now coming to this point where she see Ishmael, he's older. I'm trying to raise my son. Thank God for the promise. Um, I need to protect the promise. Um, Sarah sitting back and watching Ishmael mocking her son, posing this threat. And so she goes, runs up to Abraham, and she like, that's it. Um, she told Abraham, she didn't say, that's it. I'm just saying, I can see her saying that. Look, Abraham, that's it. No more. You're going to either need to cast out this bald woman and her son, for this bald woman is not going to be heir this son of the bond woman is not going to be heir with my son, even with Isaac, okay? So, basically, Sarah's giving Abraham an ultimatum. Now, we don't see the other or hear the other side of this ultimatum, but she dropping it. Here's what it's going to be from this day forward. You got to make a choice, Abraham, because this Ishmael is posing a threat to the promised child. Amen. This is going to be the covenant child, Isaac, not Ishmael. Now, I know you've been all good and you've been raising Ishmael. Yes, he was your firstborn son. Um, You probably, yes, proud of him. I get it. But at this point where he's posing a threat to what's really was supposed to be here, really supposed to be the promise, Isaac, we got to do something about that. 
<laughs> we got to do something about that. So this is Sarah's disposition. Amen. So this again, and, and I like how Sarah's approach is, this is the approach that we need to have whenever in our life, there is a threat to what God has promised in the spirit versus something that comes along in the flesh. Because the flesh is always hostile to the spirit. In other words, the, the flesh represents the enemy. Amen? Satan. Hostility. And then we got the spirit of God that is in us. And oftentimes in life, oftentimes in the life of a Christian, we too are going to have to make the same decision that Sarah is trying to get Abraham to make. You got to make a decision. You're going to have to cast out the flesh so that the spirit will be able to survive, be protected, right? And to be able to thrive, amen, without danger. You got to make a decision. So every day we are making the same decision. What do I need to cast out? Who do I need to cast out? What behavior do I need to cast out? So that the spirit in us uh, would not be at war. Amen. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we are not going to have our fair share of persecution. Um, because that's what this spirit of Ishmael represents. Uh, a persecuting, hostile um, hostility. That doesn't mean that we're just going to totally avoid persecution, but it does mean that God wants us to clean house every day by making right choices to not freely leave around us those things that threaten um, our dynasty in God, amen, and the spirit of God, or doesn't aggrieve, amen, uh, God. Amen. Uh, Paul, he puts it over. When we look over there in that sixth chapter of Corinthians, he gives us such things as don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Ishmael represented an unbeliever. Amen. He was not of the promise. He was not uh, uh, of the spirit. Amen. He was born in flesh. Amen. Even though he belonged to Abraham, Abraham, the father of many nations, um, righteousness, Abraham. Yes, God will favor him. God will be merciful and gracious towards him. But, 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 but he was not the promise. Hey, somebody say, don't get it twisted. Amen. Recognize what you're dealing with. Amen. So God, uh, through Paul, tells us over here in this 2 Corinthians, he tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He tells us to have fellowship only with righteousness and the things of light. Those, that's contrary to Ishmael at this point. Amen. And then he tells us that we ought to come out from among them. Verse 17 of chapter 6. Be separated. And that is pretty much what Sarah's action is displaying before us. Come out. Cast them out. Send them away. Amen. Because we have to do what is right by the spirit. We have to protect the things that is of the spirit. Okay. And so that latter part of verse 10 says, For the son of this bondwoman shall not be the heir, He's not going to be the one that is going to come into the inheritance um, with, Her uh, with Isaac. No, we're not going to share inheritance. <laughs> the inheritance was supposed to go to Isaac and Isaac alone. Amen. And to Isaac's offspring. And verse 11 says, And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Right? He felt bad. Because Ishmael was his son. It was his firstborn son. And he had a good relationship with his son. And so now his wife, probably the one time, in, if, 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 if a few, if one or two times in the Bible, where God would actually okay a man listening to the woman or his wife. Amen. And so we read on in verse 12 that God said to Abraham, don't let this be grievous in, in your sight because of the lad. So in other words, God is saying, don't worry. 
about what Sarah is suggesting that you do towards Ishmael. Um, and God says, because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, you need to listen to her. Listen to her voice, um, Abraham, for in Isaac shall be thy seed. Amen. He's the one that is called Isaac. So God clarifies to Abraham and he lets him know to listen. And here's why you need to listen. Listen to reason. Because what Abraham, excuse me, because of what Sarah said is true. That Isaac is the one that is called, not both sons, not Ishmael. But I told you that Isaac, the one that is born between you and your wife, Sarah, that child is going to be the one of promise. So thank God because he came down and gave Abraham the counsel um, and the confidence of counsel that he needed in order to be able to make the next decision. But well, what is the next decision? Verse 13. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. Okay? So Abraham was able, we're going to see coming up to this next, the 14th verse, that Abraham is able to now release the bondwoman and Ishmael. And he's able to release them and direct them to go away with a good conscience, not uh, per se feeling guilty as he was preparing to do. He it was a heavy weight on him when Sarah had given him the, uh, the, the, she gave him the ultimatum, but she laid it down for him that they're going to have to go away. Now this made Abraham feel pretty sad naturally. But in this 13th verse, God not only says it is true, it is right, do what Sarah has said, but have no fear, don't worry, because I'm still going to bless your seed as I would and as I have promised. And he had already previously promised Abraham that he was going to bless his uh, son, Ishmael, amen, and also had told the bondwoman, amen, previously, that he would bless her seed from Abraham. And so God reiterates it here in this 13th verse that I would make of Ishmael a nation. He would be um, a great nation, amen. And so all of these things coupled together gave Abraham peace and it gave Abraham a different perspective. And so verse 14 says, now with this information, Abraham rose up early in the morning and he took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar. And he put it on her shoulders. This is the, the custom that they would carry uh, water in uh, skins on their shoulder. The men would carry it on their heads. Amen. And so Hagar has this water put on her shoulder. Um, she has bread, her and the boy, and Abraham sends them away. And she departed and she wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So, imagine, now, this slave woman was within the confines and the protection of community. Amen. The community in which Abraham and Sarah dwelt. But now this woman has to leave her safe place, her community, and she has to be cast out. Amen. Um, disassociated with the community. She's going to have to leave the whole community, not just Abraham's household, but now she's got to leave the community. So she's now acting almost now as a single mother, right? She's a single mother that's now on the run with her teenage child, okay? And the scripture says that she departed and then she wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, Hagar, originally from Egypt, um, some context says she was aware of, uh, of the wilderness, you know, she had, um, she was familiar with 
uh, the wilderness scenery. She definitely knew in terms of uh, in terms of the wilderness being hot, um, oftentimes not having any water, any pastures, any trees, and things of that nature. Um, so Hagar was aware of that, and so was Abraham when he sent them out. He didn't just send them out and just, you know, like, whatever, find your way. That wasn't the case. Um, Abraham actually knew uh, that she was um, in within close proximity of other Egyptians, amen, people of her native land of Egypt, amen. And so with Abraham's, his thought was that eventually she would link up with them and then find extra provision, amen along the way but what happened is in the midst of Hagar's sadness she's probably disturbed she probably had some resentment behind the fact that so y'all gonna have me to have this child I have the child I'm trying to raise a child and I'm now having some issues with you know your wife and now y'all want to get rid of me you're going to thrust me out and the child. So she probably had a lot going on in her mind, amen, um, at this time. And as a result, it clouded her way. And that's often the times how it is with us. We cannot think clearly to see our way when we have a lot of emotions, negative emotions and or either toxic emotions that's going on in our head. Amen. And so, and, and, and oftentimes even God, he cannot get through to us to direct us um, in the way to go. Amen. So she had a lot on her heart. This lets us know that whenever we have bottled up emotions, uh, when we are disturbed, when we've been um, uh, hit from the side, amen, sucker punched with uh, sudden disturbances in our lives that we really truly need to take the time to detox, get before the Lord, ask God for counsel, ask God how to interpret uh, what is going on in my life at this moment. God, how should I see this? How should I understand? What should I do with it? Um, how do I move forward? Um, we have to consult God or else our way will be so clouded that we will not be able to make proper decisions moving forward. And oftentimes we'll move forward in the dark and just be lost. Amen. And find ourselves too wandering around, losing resources, losing peace, losing health. Amen. Because we're spinning around in circles behind some emotional uh, drama that has just uh, occurred in our lives. We got to learn how to lay it at the altar, get rid of it, look to God so that he can be able to see us through these, um, these times of uh, trouble. Amen. Amen. So verse 15, and the water was spent in the bottle. It says she's in the middle of this desert. It's, it's hot. They've been traveling. And both of them have been sipping off of this water, the boy and Hagar, Ishmael and Hagar. And the water was spent um, from the bottle that Abraham had filled up for them. And so she cast the child under one of the shrubs. So she found some shrub, a tree somewhere. And apparently Ishmael was, uh, he was sick. He was, you know, drained. Um, they were both uh, parched, amen. Uh, they needed water. There was no water. There was no streams of water that they were able to uh, determine around them or while they were en route. And now they are both, you know, medically, what you would call it, you would say that they were dehydrated. So they were dying of dehydration. Um, maybe even famine too. They may have ran, ran out of bread as well. All right, but you need that water and water was something that they did not have. And so both of them are on the verge of death. Amen. Thirsty. And so verse 16 says, and she went and sat her down over against him a good way off. And it were, it was about a way or the uh, distance of a bow shot. You, you know, you cocked the bow back, 
um, however far the bowl would go, that's how far Hagar had distanced herself from Ishmael after laying him down underneath of this shrub, probably just thinking that he was just going to die off. He was in such bad shape. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of my, of my child. I don't even want to see it. Amen. And she sat over against him, apart from him, and lifted up her voice, and she wept. Amen. She wept. She wept tears. She prayed. She was in a moment of despair. She was like, I don't know what else to do. I'm just going to sit here, me and the boy, and we're going to die. Amen. I see no help around me. I see no resources around me. Um, everyone that I've known is deserted. and is far away from me. I can't go any further. This is where we're going to wind up. This is where we're going to be. Amen. And so when she said that, she heard God. Amen. Which was a voice. Amen. I'm sorry. Verse 17 says, and God heard the voice of the lad. Verse 17 says, and God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand. For I will make of him a great nation. And so look at this. And God heard the voice of the lad. He didn't really say, the scripture doesn't even point out that he heard her voice or saw her tears or felt her in despair. It says that God heard the voice of the lad. There's a connection with that because promise was in the lad. God's covenant lied. Um, Amen. With the lad, God told Hagar that he would bless her seed. And God's promise here is now being esteemed as being lifted up and highlighted in the midst of their despair. God keeps his word. Amen. And God heard the voice of the lad. And maybe, who knows, maybe Ishmael could have prayed also. Amen. While he was laying underneath of the tree. But nonetheless, the connection between God's promise and the lad, God respected that. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What ill of thee, Hagar? Fear not. Don't worry. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Wow. Thank God for the connection of prayer. Amen. That lies. Amen. And the promise and in the people of God. And 18 says, Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now look at God here. God is fulfilling the promise that he made unto Hagar. Amen. For I will make him a great nation. Ishmael would off, uh, would e eventually, ultimately, become the nation of the Ishmaelites, which are now the Arabs, amen, the Arab nation, amen. So God tells her in verse 18, get in position, get the boy, amen, because this blessing is being pronounced. I made the blessing, I promised you the blessing, and now I'm pronouncing this blessing. He is going to be a great nation, amen. God keeps his promise. And in verse 19, and God opened her eyes after that. And she saw a well of water. And she went and she filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. So Ishmael was the worser off, it appears. Amen. And God opened her eyes. So ultimately, again, because her eyes, her insight, uh, her way was blinded behind the drama that she went through, amen. It was probably harboring in her heart, spinning around in her mind. She was very disturbed. She could not see. But God, once he relieved her, amen, and comforted her, 
a man behind the lad signaling to heaven, a man on her behalf, God comforted her and gave her again, reiterated to her the promise. And so now her eyes are open. Thank you for hope. That's what God gave her. Amen. He gave her hope and hope is what caused her to be able to see her way again. God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water, which was right there, right there in Beersheba. Amen. There was water. It's just that she did not see it. Amen. God provided for her. Amen. And so she went, she filled up her bottle. She gave a drink to the lad. And verse 20 says, and God was with the lad. God is still with the lad. Why? Because the lad's father is Abraham and he promised Abraham that his first seed would still be blessed. Even though it was outside of the covenant with the bondwoman woman versus her, Abraham's wife, Sarah. But still God favored his offspring. Amen. Which was Ishmael. God was with the lad and he allowed the lad to grow. Yes. And the lad dwelt in the wilderness. Amen. Even though he would be called a, a wild uh, man in the wilderness, he would uh, afflict other people and other people would afflict him. But possibly that can be associated with just him being in the wilderness. Amen. Um, where he would need to protect himself. Amen. Through people that are also trans transiting through the wilderness. Amen. That Ishmael would become this archer. Um, this archer would be uh, of the bow and archer, amen. Once again, he would grow up to be a man that would remain in pastures of the wilderness, amen, where there was really no place to set up camp, amen. You couldn't set up a home in the wilderness. It was just mainly uh, in between places, amen. Um, but this is where God would have him to dwell in the wilderness. He became an archer, amen, amen. Um, and there, that was his skill, amen, to be able to protect himself, to be able to provide for himself with the animals that he would need to uh, live amongst, but also be able to use as his nourishment, as his food, amen. But most of all, we see the promises kept by God towards Ishmael, amen, which has given hope, amen, that God is no respecter of person, God has no discretion. When God says that he's going to bless you, then he's going to bless you. And what you may do, amen, when God has truly made you a covenant, what you do won't matter. If God has purpose in the covenant that he has made to you, God is going to keep the covenant, amen, and he'll find a way. Even though we didn't tamper it and call ourselves trying to help God to uh, bring about the promise, even though we didn't put our hands into it, God still ultimately has the power to make things be as he would have them to be. Amen. That is God's omnipotence. Amen. God sees. He sees that we sitting back trying to figure out how to be able to go about hurrying up and speeding up the promises that he has given us. Amen. God sees that. Um, and we see that all along the way. Even while man was putting their hand um, towards the promise and trying to finagle things, manipulate, manipulate things, God was still there. Amen. He still, he was still there. He did not go about cursing Abraham or Sarah for her bright ideas. He did not curse the bondwoman. He did not curse the bondwoman's seed, Ishmael. Amen. Um, he still went about and ultimately Isaac will be the holder or the beholder of the legacy and the inheritance and the promise that God had initially 30 over 30 years ago gave Abraham. Amen. Over there in that 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. God said he's going to do it and he's going to do it. So nothing that we do in between will affect, amen, the true promise or the true covenant that God has given us. So that is our lesson pretty much. Injustice and hope. We see this injustice swirling around. It probably could be injustice from, uh, from Sarah. She probably felt like injustice was against her, especially when she did not yet have a child. 
Um, but then when she's seen the bald woman's child, Ishmael, affecting or threatening her promise, Isaac, um, we see it was probably injustice from Abraham's perspective when Sarah told Abraham this bond woman and her seed gonna have to go. Um, so he probably thought that was unjust. The bond woman and Ishmael probably was on the end of that injustice too when they were cast out and had to wander in the wilderness. They were probably sitting there saying, how do we get here? You know, this is not fair. Amen. That we would be cast out and uh, helpless, you know, um, caused to wander. Amen. And then we see the ray of hope behind this story. Amen. That God keeps his promise. Amen. We see that ray of hope and how God distributed that hope um, unto Hagar and unto Ishmael, unto Abraham. Amen. Um, that his child, firstborn, he's still going to be okay, Abraham. And unto Sarah, the faithfulness of God, amen, that Sarah can still see that God is still going to remain faithful. So, that's pretty much our lesson, the breakdown of this lesson. Um, great takeaways. I'm going to read for you all before we end this lesson. I, I, I read a, a great summary of our lesson that we can take to us and, and just apply it <clears throat> to our thought life whenever we come across what we may deem as injustice and hope. Amen. Comes out of our Sunday school book, the you and I. And it says that very often when we are feeling isolated, hurt, or even victimized, it is difficult to remember that the God we serve is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Amen. He knows everything that is going on in our lives. He knows when we are hurt and he knows who is hurting us. Thank God for that. Our faith demands that we trust him to reconcile every situation in his appointed time. God is everywhere all of the time. There is no situation that we endure alone. He is available to comfort us if we ask him. God is all powerful. When present trials make us anxious or fearful, we must remember that the provision for all that we need rests in his hands. Christians are not immune from tests, from trials, and from tribulations. Nor are Christian families immune from dysfunction. Through these hardships, we must hold on to the promise and the hope that only God can provide. Amen? Amen. So that is our takeaway thought for this lesson today. And we pray that you have gotten some um, extra understanding or refreshed uh, perspective from this story, very familiar story of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Ishmael, and Hagar. Amen. This family domestic dynamics that went on in between. Amen. So we thank God again for the study of his word. Thank you for tuning in again to the Christian's Endeavor Sunday School International Broadcast. I'm Minister Coleman, and we will see you again next week. We want you to have a blessed week ahead. Amen. Bye-bye.